Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome everyone to our uh, expert panel discussion, Children's Deportation in Focus, uh, responding to human rights abuses and war crimes. My name is Katrina Raszewska. I am a legal expert at the Regional Center for Human Rights. And today, I have the privilege to be the moderator of this uh, expert discussion. So our goal is to listen to valuable insights from uh, our esteemed panelists today as of uh, unlawful deportation and forcible transfer of Ukrainian children and uh, human rights violation accompanying them. Together we will try to, like, uh, to, to answer the question uh, what are the mechanisms to repatriate, rehabilitate and reintegrate Ukrainian children ensuring justice and the right to the truth. So now as a, a moderator, but also as a lawyer, I would like to shape the general context of uh, our discussion. So this event is like a final point of our joint commitment to justice, protection of the rights of the child and international law. We are at a pivotal moment of our history because uh, today uh, the number of affected children, children victims of unlawful deportation and forcible transfer, is more than 19,546. And you know this is not a final number. These only children already identified by Ukrainian competent bodies like unlawfully deported and forcibly transferred. We have managed to repatriate only 386 of uh, these children. It was uh, carried out through joint efforts of uh, Ukrainian governmental sector and uh, also Ukrainian state bodies, despite significant obstacles put in place by the Russian Federation authorities. The Russian Federation has explained many times uh, the vulnerable position of Ukrainian children and their legal representatives, not recognizing Ukrainian legal documents, forcing them to pass a DNA and a polygraph test, subjecting them to forced nudity and even unlawful confinement. We also know that the Russian Federation has repeatedly refused to repatriate Ukrainian orphans and children proud of parental care. And now, at least 380 of these children are forcibly transferred to Russian families. This is a very dangerous moment because uh, these children risk to become victims uh, of other international crimes like forcible circumscription or discriminatory persecution. So we need to put in place one unique legal mechanism of repatriation, rehabilitation and reintegration of Ukrainian children. As of efforts of my organization, Regional Center for Human Rights, we are dealing not only with analytical research, but also with accountability processes. My organization, in cooperation with the Lankin Institute for Genocide Prevention, submitted several communications to the International Criminal Court related to the forcible transfer of Ukrainian children into the Russian national group. We studied the imposition of the Russian citizenship on these children. Our findings concluded that uh, if the Russian Federation acted solely for humanitarian reasons, then rather than deport these children to the territory of the Russian Federation uh, or even to Belarus or South Ossetia, the Russian Federation allowed the evacuation of these children to the territory of Ukraine. And uh, rather than to impose to these children Russian citizenship, the Russian Federation amended legislation related to simplifying procedure of obtaining medical care, educational services, or social benefits on occupied territories. However, this was not the case. And uh, now my organization, together with Save Ukraine, uh, are finalizing our communication to the International Criminal Court related to unreasonable delay in repatriation of Ukrainian children because we consider this delay to be a distinct international crime. And we hope that this communication can attract the attention of the international community and uh, can contribute 
to the safe return of Ukrainian children to their homes. As uh, you know, uh, on March uh, 2022, uh, 2023, sorry, uh, the pretrial chamber two of the International Criminal Court has issued two arrest warrants against Putin and Maria Lvova Belova. However, they are not the only guilty persons. There are thousands of other implementing policy of uh, forcible eradication of Ukrainian national identity of uh, our children through different means. And uh, I know that uh, our panelists today uh, will uh, tell more about all these uh, means, uh, all these instruments, and also share with us uh, their experience and also experience uh, from the ground. Please now join me in welcoming our first panelist, Ms. Veronika Bilkova. She is a head of the Department of International Law at the Charles University in Prague and a senior researcher at the Center for International Law of the Institute of International Relations in the Czech Republic. She is a member of the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe and of the Management Board of the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. In 2022-2023, Ms. Veronika Bilkova uh, was a member of the three, so of all, Moscow mechanisms uh, dealing with the conflict in Ukraine. Dear Veronika, what violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law accompany the process of uh, uh, displacement of Ukrainian children? And uh, uh, by your perspective, can international organizations be more efficient for this international crime and how? Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. I would first like to express my gratitude to the organizers for including this panel. I think it's very important to keep the topic in the public space. And many thanks also to our chair for setting the scene, for explaining the facts so I can focus on the legal uh, questions, which is my, my main field. So I will start with the first question, which actually is quite complex. We issued an opinion on particularly this question in May of this year, and the opinion or the, the report has almost 100 pages, so you can imagine how much there is to say, but I'll try to be brief. There is no doubt that the displacement of Ukrainian children from Ukraine, either to the Russian territory or to the territory under the Russian control, is subject to the rules of public international law. More specifically, it is subject to the rules of international humanitarian law, which applies specifically in times of armed conflict, also to the rules of international human rights law, which applies both in times of peace and in times of armed conflict, and finally international criminal law, which again applies both in times of peace and in times of armed conflict. The first two branches, international humanitarian law and human rights law, impose obligations on to states, so primarily the Russian Federation, while the last one, international criminal law, focuses on individuals and binds individuals. That's important for the responsibility questions. Now, for the purposes of the legal analysis, it's important to distinguish two phenomena that we have here. The first one is the very displacement, that means the forcible transfer and deportation of children, and also their protracted, I think we can use the term detention, because they are not staying there voluntarily, so that's the first phenomenon. The second phenomenon is the treatment to which they are exposed while being transferred to the Russian territory or to the territory under the Russian control. Concerning the first phenomenon, that means the transfer, whatever legal ground is provided or is offered by the Russian Federation and whatever the original lawfulness of this ground, it's quite clear that the protracted detention of these children constitutes a violation of international law, especially international humanitarian law, more specifically a violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which generally prohibits transfer of civilian population from the occupied territories outside of it, and also Article 78 of the Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, which concerns specifically children. The same treatment also highly probably constitutes a war crime, and it was already mentioned that currently the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is already seized with the matter and has already issued the first arrest warrants. In addition, it might also, and highly probably does, 
constitute a crime against humanity. A crimes against humanity, unlike war crimes, can be committed both in times of peace and in times of armed conflict, and it is specific by, it, it features one specific uh, element, which is the fact that it needs to take place in the context of a systematic or widespread attack against civilian population. And there can be little doubt that there is this systematic and widespread attack against the civilian population uh, being carried out by the Russian forces against the civilian population of Ukraine. So that is for the transfer itself. Then the treatment, we didn't spend that much time on the treatment, but the treatment is also problematic. These children are exposed to the so-called patriotic re-education, that means they need to speak only in Russian, they need to learn the Russian version of history, they need to sing Russian anthem. As already mentioned, some of them get deprived of their citizenship, and they, some of them also, we don't have the exact figures, but we know that a certain number of these children have also been adopted, and that might mean the end of their traces, because the adoption means kind of a civil death. We, it's very difficult to find these children. This treatment, again, violates clearly international law, this time mainly international human rights law. The most widely ratified instrument under the human rights law, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which enshrines a couple of human rights which have clearly been violated, such as the right to identity, the right to family life, the right to family, uh, edu uh, family re reunification, and uh, the right to education, and I could go on and on with these violated provisions and with these violated rights. What's important is that you see that the violations have been taking place on the two levels, the level of the state, giving rise to the responsibility of the Russian Federation, and also the level of individuals, or crimes, crimes against humanity, giving rise also to the responsibility of concrete persons. And as rightly noticed, and this is a very important comment, we should not focus only on one level of people. I mean, these are complicated crimes in which people at different levels of the society take place, uh, take part, and it's very important to go after all of them so that no one thinks that they will escape simply because they are too high or too low. I think I've exhausted my time with this single question, so maybe I leave the second one for the next round. Yes, yeah, yes, you can, uh, and uh, you like uh, mentioned uh, many aspects of uh, uh, Maria Solana intervention, but uh, and I would like also to thank uh, Miss Vernika for her for her amazing work on Ukraine and on crimes committed by Russians uh, on our territory uh, during her uh, mandate in the uh, Moscow mechanism. And now I would like to pass the floor to our next panelist, Mr. Zbigniew Vlasochik. Mr. Zbigniew Vlasochik is a professor of law and criminology at the University of Warsaw and the director of its Human Trafficking Studies Center. He is also an expert of the European Commission, the OEC, and the Council of Europe. Mr. Lasochik has participated in over 60 international fact-finding and monitoring missions around the world. So, Mr. Lasochik, uh, taking into account your professional background and your expertise, what actually does human trafficking mean? And does the displacement of Ukrainian children by the Russian Federation have elements of human trafficking? And it is now expedient to apply regulations to combat this crime. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say that I'm honored to be here and I thank very much uh, the organizers for, for invitation. Um, the, the question is extremely difficult. Um, on my way here um, yesterday, I heard the news in Polish media that um, again, 20, and that 59 kids were um, kidnapped somewhere in, in Ukraine and, and transferred to, again, nobody knows where. I was, uh, it, it, the media said that it was the request of President of Ukraine, but there was no more details. And this is my first remark that um, I have collected a lot of media information about this issue, and there is no details. So we have no idea what is happening, what, how, what is the treatment you mentioned of, of these kids, where they are. We know only some part of, of, the, of the truth. So this is the first issue. Then the second thing, and you asked me, are there elements of human trafficking? 
let me let me say about two dimensions of this. First, nominal and real. At the nominal level, when we compare the situation we described at this panel with the definition of human trafficking, we can hardly say that this is purely human trafficking because in, in human trafficking we have a special way of recruitment, special ways of uh, manipulation to make people um, enslaved and, and being controlled totally. And then the third element of human trafficking is exploitation. So let me get back to this information, of, uh, to, 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 to this remark about lack of information. We, we don't have answers for the questions whether, what is the way of recruitment, what are the ways of manipulation, and is there any exploitation or not. For instance, we, we don't have enough details on the question whether these kids are being exploited sexually. There are some rumors, there are some information, but not systematically. Are there victims of forced labor? We have not enough information, but what we do have is we have almost, we are almost positive that many of them are being adopted. And we can say that at the international legal standards, these adoptions are illegal, because in fact, these kids are victims of, um, of international crime. Well, what we also know is that many of these kids are being indoctrinated. What is this? When we look at this closely, we can say that people are, especially kids, are being indoctrinated because there is some idea to use them in the future, in long run, maybe as a soldiers, but now maybe as a polite kids in the, in the Russian families. So from that moment, and when someone is benefiting from these operations, like adoption or indoctrination, so we may say that there is some exploitation and that there is some, some profit of, of people who are being involved in that. So at the, at the level of, of reality, we can say that there are some symptoms of human trafficking. But what is human trafficking in the nutshell? It's the situation when one person controls the second person to make this person completely um, subordinated and to exploit that person. So when we look at the situation I try to, to describe, we may say that these kids are for sure victims of international crime like, for instance, genocide, but there are also very serious suspicions that they are also victims of human trafficking or some forms of human trafficking. Indoctrination was never considered by us as a form of exploitation, but now, maybe on our eyes, we have a new form of um, exploitation being created. Who are the victims uh, we are talking about? I, I see three important categories. First, kids who are institutionalized, orphans. They are, they are trained to be, to be polite, to be subordinated, and to be controlled. Small kids who are not aware where they are and what will happen to them. And then teenagers, their situation is most difficult because they have, they are well aware of their identity and what they, they need, their needs, and, and so on. And there is one element which might be interesting for, for all of us. Namely, I, I found information that some of the kids are not allowed to make a call to relatives. What is this? From the legal point of view, it might be torture or inhuman treatment because as we look at the um, basic standards of treatment in detention, the first obligation of the state is to provide the person in detention possibility to inform the family about where I am currently. So this, this at the level of treatment, this lack of cooperation might mean that this people, that these kids are also victims of torture. Uh, and uh, I would like just to add, uh, 
that um, Mr. Lasochik mentioned uh, that indoctrination now is not considered a considered element of human trafficking. However, according to the United Nations guidelines, uh, indoctrination is one of elements of abduction. And as you know, we have special representative of Secretary General uh, on uh, children and armed conflict uh, who has this mandate to monitor the situation also in Ukraine. And uh, this is uh, Ms. Gamba. She had uh, um, some meetings with the Ukrainian government, but also with Maria Lvova office. However, she thought that the unlawful deportation and forcible transfer of Ukrainian children is uh, not inside her mandate, and uh, that is why she didn't visit uh, facilities where Ukrainian children uh, were detained, and uh, it was uh, like our unique possibility to, to visit such places, because the Russian Federation has uh, limited uh, not only access to information, to data, but also to uh, facilities where Ukra Ukrainian children are. So this is also the problem, how to, how to call all these actions committed by Russians and how to call them by the manner that uh, to cover all children and to guarantee that these children will not be like in legal vacuum without uh, any uh, assistance from people who has uh, competence and who also has uh, a real power to visit them, but they uh, think that uh, this is not uh, inside uh, the uh, mandate prescribed by some uh, resolutions and uh, other acts at the level of the United Nations. However, it's like only my personal opinion. Uh, and uh, now I would like, first of all, to thank um, Mr. Zbigniew Lasojic for his uh, intervention. I know that uh, we will have some questions from our audience to you, but also I will have uh, another question to you and to uh, Ms. Belkova. Is, this is uh, for second round of our discussion. And uh, now I would like to pass the floor to our uh, next panelist, Maria Sulalina. Maria Sulalina is uh, the head of the Center for Civic Education at Manda and a member of the Humanitarian Policy Group of the Crimea Platform Expert Network. Uh, Maria, uh, I would like uh, to ask you what uh, actual methods of eradication of Ukrainian national identity the Russian Federation uses and uh, how the future processes of rehabilitation and reintegration of Ukrainian children should be. Uh, thank you, Katerina. First of all, I want to thank your organizers for having such uh, a panel. And also, I'm honored to be on the same panel with such distinguished experts, uh, especially in law, so I don't have to focus on law uh, in my intervention. Um, when we're talking about um, education of Ukrainian identity, uh, it's important to, to keep in mind that we are not talking only about children who was deported or forcibly transferred, uh, to Russian territory, we are talking about all Ukrainian children who are now living on the territories which are under con Russian control. So we are talking also about our children who are now lives in occupation. And we are basically talking about the system which has clear intent to destroy Ukrainian identity uh, in our children. Why I'm talking, uh, telling that this is the system? Because it has different components and it includes indoctrination, which we already mentioned, it includes militarization of children, it includes destruction of Ukrainian component in education, and it also includes propaganda of war. And this system doesn't appear after a full-scale invasion. This system was building from the first days of war, from 2014, and we saw how this system was building firstly on occupied territories in Crimea, and then it was transferred to other occupied territories, and children who are was deported are also victims and are in the same system. Uh, this system basically uh, covers all levels of life of children. Uh, it covers formal education uh, in schools where children forced to go to the schools and have to study on Russian programs. Uh, and Russian programs basically aimed to uh, build Russian patriots from our children. 
It covers non-formal education such as different sport clubs, art clubs, uh, and for sure camps, which is a huge issue during summer period. And it also covers uh, different youth movements uh, such as Yun Army, Movement of the First, but there are a lot of different movements on all occupied territories and in Russia itself, which are tries to uh, took in the movement more and more children uh, who are living on the territories which are under controls. And uh, if we look on the documents which uh, regulate um, work with children, either in the educational sphere, uh, either in the non-formal education, the main aim which uh, Russia described in these documents is to form Russian civic patriots. And when we look deeper on this document, and when we look deeper on the textbooks, school textbooks by which your children are studying, being Russian patriot, it means to die for Russian Federation. So basically our children are learned to die to protect Russian imperialistic goals. And if you're a child who is living on the occupied territories and who uh, doesn't manage to flee this territory, you don't actually have a lot uh, of scenario of your life there. The first scenario uh, is your stay in your hometown. As I said, you're forced to go to the school, uh, you're forced to study on the Russian programs, and you don't have a possibility not to go to the school because your parents could be deprived of parental rights if you will not be attending school. And you also uh, could be afraid to attend Ukrainian school online because we already have cases when uh, Russian forces came to the children who attend Ukrainian schools. And we also know that internet providers uh, give information to special forces if child is attending Ukrainian school online. So you're going to the school, and in the school you're studying on the Russian textbooks where are the narratives that there is no Ukraine itself, that all territory of Ukraine is part of Russian Federation, where you learn to, to be uh, proud of Russian wars in the history, uh, when there is a lot of heroization of war, and in the textbooks it is a heroization of Russian soldiers, soldiers from Chechen war, and soldiers who are now fighting against Ukraine. You're also forced to attend special uh, classes such as conversation about important, uh, to which uh, invited Russian soldiers and Russian priests. Uh, and during these classes you learned about Russian forces and you learned about so-called real um, aims of so-called special operation. Uh, and all of this built for you also to uh, want this child to want you to become a part of one of the Russian youth movements. This is the first scenario. The second scenario is basically the same, but uh, because of um, some situation, there are different uh, good visitation, uh, you are attending summer camp, or you are going to their uh, so-called study trip to Russian Federation. Basically, this will be the two, three weeks program where you will be brainwashed, where you will be learned how to shoot, where you will be learned how to throw a grenade, and to, where you will be indoctrinated like, much harder than during the school. And also, you couldn't, there is a possibility that you will not be returned from this trip. And here we go to the third scenario. When you are deported or forcibly transferred from your home. All the same is happening to you what was happening in the first two scenarios, but it is much worse because you are now in the hostile environment. You don't have anyone, anyone close to you. You don't have uh, people with whom you could talk honestly. And you are living in the society which uh, tells you, first of all, that you are Russian, and second, uh, you're under so massive propaganda uh, from which you couldn't escape at all. And um, this is why when we're talking about deportation of children or when we're talking about eradication of Ukrainian identity of children uh, with a broader uh, context, we're actually talking in the situation where time is playing against us 
and this is really is because Russia created really complex, widespread system of eradication of Ukrainian identity. And this system is already working for nine years. Children who was five, six years when war started in 2014, they are now 14, 15 years old. Some of them already members of UN Army and other movements. These children are victims of this system. And with all these new actions which Russia now implemented, I'm talking about uh, these unified textbooks, I'm talking about implementing uh, military classes in schools, we clearly see that Russia is preparing our children to become uh, a reserve for mobilization and basically to take our children for the war against our country. And this is why when we're talking about rehabilitation, and I hope uh, I will have time to talk more about this on the second part of our discussion, we have to keep in mind that we are not talking about the rehabilitation and reintegration of 20,000 of children, which Katerina mentioned, who was deported. We are talking about reintegration and rehabilitation of more than 1 million of Ukrainian children who are staying on the occupied territories who are victim of this Russian system and who also are waiting for us, for, for first of all, to save them, and secondly, who also have a right to have a future uh, in the context of peace and not in the culture of war. Uh, thank you, Maria, for your valuable insights. And uh, I guess that it's really crucial to listen to people who are working on the ground and who have such an experience. And uh, I would like just to provide our audience with uh, some figures. Uh, my organization has started the documentation of uh, the cases uh, of the so-called displacement to the re-education camps uh, during this uh, campaign of 2023. And uh, since uh, May 2023, and uh, till uh, September 2023, we have documented at least 7,136 children who were deported to Russia for this reason, uh, to 46 institutions. Some of these camps uh, are situated in Vladivostok. Uh, this is uh, 8,000 kilometers away from their homes. We have documented also displacement to the territory of Belarus, and uh, these are approximately uh, three, four camps, because uh, one camp uh, we need uh, to verify information from open sources. And uh, children in Belarus, uh, uh, we pretended that uh, these children were returned. However, uh, according to information of the director of the Novopolotsk school uh, number 14, uh, some children were fostered for some period of time by uh, teachers from this school. That is why we can't uh, verify or we, we can't, con can't confirm or deny that these children were uh, repatriated. And uh, what is really important that... The General Prosecutor Office on the investigation and prosecution of um, international court crimes. Within that uh, framework, um, I'm supporting the team that is focusing on crimes against and affecting children which is uh, normally uh, very neglected in other situations and conflicts. So we are very happy to see that Ukraine is leading on putting uh, this very child-focused uh, crime, international court crime or deportation, which only can be committed against children, into, into the forefront of uh, the investigations and prosecutions. Um, so um, I want to build a little bit on what my colleagues have been uh, flagging into uh, the, uh, let's say, the challenges and the, the, the obstacles and the, the key points and elements that need to be taken into account to conduct investigations and prosecutions. And uh, it is true that um, uh, it is already a progress to be focusing on, on, on a child-specific crime uh, from the palette of uh, international court crimes. Uh, but normally, children are uh, very often uh, neglected into uh, these processes. And the other types of crimes that we can take a look at, and my colleagues have already <laughs> flagged some of them, all this palette of other war crimes, or uh, eventually in Ukraine, 
uh, we cannot use uh, the crimes against humanity because this is not part of the uh, domestic criminal um, uh, legal framework. Uh, but all these facts that Maria was uh, flagging uh, can be uh, qualified as uh, multiple crimes no? in, the, in the international uh, uh, list of um, the list of international court crimes. And, uh, and this is one, 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 one issue, you know, that uh, let's uh, also uh, focus on deportations and let's open our minds to the all other rest of crimes that could be committed against children or could have child victims among them and try to do an effort also as well to try to conduct these investigations, legal analysis, uh, prosecutions through a kind of what I may call child-sensitive approach, which is uh, uh, normally not present there. Uh, but why? Because, for example, here we have a panel of uh, uh, dedicated professionals, very specialized, each of us on our, on our domain, but when we, look at, we take a look at, uh, at the, the professionals that are on the ground doing the proper investigations and, and prosecutions, uh, they don't have um, this level of, um, of, of specialization. Uh, the scale and the scope of what is happening in Ukraine and what has been happening in Ukraine since 2014 is massive, is huge. And, uh, and, and there, there is a need for having more specialized investigators, more specialized prosecutors that can integrate these aspects of child rights, child uh, rights integration, a context analysis that takes into account all these child rights violations that we have been mentioning, uh, the, the mindset to be open to qualify these facts in different ways. Is this uh, fact of treating the children this way torture? It amounts to this other crime. So all of this is a, a full dimension perspective that we need to integrate into the process of investigating and prosecuting um, crimes against children uh, in Ukraine. Um, another, aspect that, another aspect that I would like to maybe highlight uh, alongside the specialization of, of all the, the resources of the professionals working in, in this field is, um, is the element of uh, having this approach that puts the victims at the center when we are conducting investigations and when we are conducting prosecutions. Uh, in this case, we are talking about children, no? And uh, we are talking about children and we are talking about all the individuals that are connected to the child that are affected by all these crimes and all these facts. No, it's, 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 it's the children, is the, the, the families. Uh, this, is, this is very much needed when we uh, do investigations on, on, on crimes that are, affect uh, children as victims. And I think this is also, uh, in Ukraine, I think this is a big, big opportunity to try to do this from the beginning, uh, at least on everything that connects to the 22 uh, full-scale invasion. We are, I mean, 20, 2014 is a little bit uh, far, but at least to whatever concerns the 2022 uh, full-scale invasion, along the crimes related to that, I think we're still on, on time to, to really conduct investigations that put the children uh, as victims at, at the center. Um, and another, another aspect that uh, I would like maybe to highlight in, 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 uh, in line with my colleagues have been uh, flagging is, um, is that we need to systematize these approaches when we are conducting investigations and, and prosecutions. Um, uh, we need to integrate this in the processes. We need to integrate this in the mindsets. We need to integrate this uh, a whole the system that is working on investigating and prosecuting these um, these crimes. And this also relates to uh, the elements of coordination. No? Uh, we should also try to work uh, together with a more coordinated manner to um, to to make uh, the prospects of meaningful justice for children uh, possible. And uh, and the more we tackle the different uh, aspects of, um, of, the, of the of the legal framework that we can utilize to uh, to quantify all these all these facts, the, the better we can do. Uh, and and, and, and it's, it's very, very important to have all this contextual knowledge you know, that uh, Maria was bringing uh, to, to the table uh, because it, it is very important to do this context analysis to afterwards do the analysis of the elements of the crime and what this means and what it doesn't, doesn't mean other things and this other thing. No. So I think there is there is um, there is uh, there are prospects to to make this uh, more child sensitive, uh, 
and it, this includes also as well the participation of the children. I, I know criminal accountability is a, is a balance between protection and, and participation. Uh, we need to, to protect the victims of uh, these crimes, we need to comply with child rights requirements, uh, we need to avoid re-traumatization of children, we should not uh, re-interview children multiple times, and this affects all of us, uh, those working on prosecutorial investigations, but those other working on NGOs, doing documentation, investigations, and even journalists. Um, so we really need to, to all be on the same page with this kind of um, child, rights, uh, child rights perspectives and, and, and approaches to how we conduct investigations and prosecutions and, uh, and really uh, try to connect with this balancing act of protecting and allowing also children to participate in the process as victims. Uh, normally we, we don't see children, we want to protect children, we don't want them to really engage in the, in the justice <coughs> process, uh, they have been victimized, uh, but I think there is, there is always a space and room for, uh, for children, child victims to, to be able to participate in, in these processes in a way or another. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Javier. And, uh, Thank you for highlighting that in each process related to children, uh, the principle of uh, child best interest is our priority. So it's uh, crucial to, to guarantee the respect to this principle. Not only when we are talking about uh, like uh, repatriation, rehabilitation, reintegration, but also justice restoration processes. Victim-centric approach covers, in this case, also child's best interest principle. Okay. Second round of our questions to uh, distinguished panelists, but also I would like to like encourage our audience to think about their questions because uh, yes, we are here to listen to our panelists, but also to uh, like create a meaningful dialogue and discussion. So be ready to the third round of our uh, panel. Uh, I am sure that Maria will uh, agree with me that uh, Ukrainian non-governmental organizations are trying to cooperate with uh, all international organizations and other stakeholders, like uh, institutions of the United Nations system, with uh, many monitoring missions, also with uh, um, International Independent Commission of Inquiry, and uh, the ICC, and so on. However, uh, what is uh, your point? What is your opinion? Whether international organization uh, may be more efficient? What uh, can they do more for protection of Ukrainian children, in particular children victims of deportation, of eradication of Ukrainian national identity, of uh, children on occupied territories, and so on? Uh, thank you. It's a hard and interesting question. Um, Basically, we are in the situation uh, when we have a lot of hopes for international organization and when we understand that um, this is one of the only ways to return our children uh, and uh, we need to them to finally uh, have a mechanism of uh, returning our children because the way how children are returned now is the way uh, we will be returning one, two, three child uh, in a trip uh, and we will not uh, have enough time to return all our children. So we need international organization to do their job basically and to return our children. At the same time, um, it's our organization, um, um, like, how to say it correctly, I don't know. Um, I think it's our organization um, idea that uh, international organization didn't do their job for nine years. And they only start talking about children and start talking about protection of our children after full-scale invasion. So we only hear about deportation of children uh, and there is still no real mechanism of bringing our children back. But uh, children who are remaining on the occupied territories, they are still in the shadow and nothing is uh, going on. And to only after full-scale invasion, we see sanctions 
for the, on the persons who are responsible for the militarization and indoctrination of our children for years, and it is not enough yet, and you know that a lot of people who are both engaged in militarization and in the deportation, they are not on the sanction list. So, international community has to do their job finally and not start uh, being, uh, how to say it, being too diplomatic and trying to find uh, some negotiations with, with Russia. There couldn't be any negotiation with terrorists anymore. And you know, Maria, what is worse is that uh, during these uh, same nine years, for example, the uh, United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child um, like, uh, um, wrote the report on the situation uh, on the occupied territories by Israel and uh, made very interesting conclusions as of militarization and uh, indoctrination in uh, the education given by Israel on occupied territories. And uh, uh, this policy was already recognized like a violation of the Article 8 and also of the Article 29 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, so the Russian Federation did the same, but there were not the same findings. Maybe anyone would like to add something, please feel free to jump in. Very briefly, because I'm, I'm um, looking at the, at the time and being convinced that um, the essence of the conference is the discussion, I will be very brief, but I was uh, uh, also asked to, to, to think over the question how, what we can do in, in the future. And uh, let me say that um, start with with a with a common general comment that we know we all know that human rights protects us from the state, but human trafficking is a little bit different because standard of human trafficking protection of victims is something what is against the pros against the criminals and the main the main actor is the state who should do it how to help victims and to go after criminals. In this particular case, we are in trouble because the criminal is the state, is Russian Federation, is the government of Russia. And we have now facing completely different uh, situations. So uh, fact-finding missions are okay, provided that there is cooperation. In that case, there will be no cooperation, cooperation whatsoever. Human trafficking is violation of human rights. This means that the state has a long list of rights, of obligations, towards the victim. One of them is to find criminals, uh, perpetrators. So I think from that perspective, we have to accept that obligation to find these children and then to, to put these criminals before the court is our is the responsibility of our, our entire human community. Not one country, second country, UN, whatever it is. All of us. Um, governments, um, prime minister, presidents, kings, we all are responsible for this. This is the, the task of civilized world. If we will not do it, shame on us. Many organizations after war started were very keen, and I, I heard uh, words and words how much we are ready to do for Ukraine. Let's see. Let's try. That would be the test. Are these international institutions ready to go after criminals and then find the children? There is a lot of countries doing good business in, in, in Russia. Ask them, let's ask them also to her to, to identify these kids, find them, and um, let them get back to, to Ukraine. And, and finally, as I said, there will be no chance for full, for uh, full-fledged fact-finding mission. But let's agree that the all possible agents operating undercover in Russia of civilized world will trace will find information and will help Ukraine to find any single child in, in Russia. 
we cannot accept that any longer. Thank you, Mr. El Sergeant. And now, Ms. Veronica Belkova. Thank you. To follow up on the previous speakers, I agree with Maria that the question is indeed a very complicated one also because of the fact that international organizations by their very nature are very different from each other. So we can't expect the same behavior, let's say, from the United Nations as we can from the Council of Europe, which has anyway expelled the Russian Federation, as we can from the OEC, from some specialized organizations. So each institution, each organization, and also each state has its role to play in what I fully agree here should be, in the end, the, the effort of the whole international community. The final ultimate goal is clear. It should be to stop this practice and to make sure that all the children are returned to their families. It's actually quite interesting to see, at least from the figures, it seems that the practice has actually stopped to a large extent because the, the figures grew quite rapidly last year, but then, at least according to the, to the figures provided officially by, by Ukraine, they have been more or less the same from the end of the last year and especially from March. So it seems that it might be a coincidence. It might be that the Russian Federation has become more, uh, let's say, more elaborated in its tactics, so it's not so visible, but it might also be that the arrest warrant has actually worked into, at least to some extent, and that the practice has at least to some extent been, let's say, either stopped or not been so massive any longer. So that's the ultimate goal. In the meantime, I, I've tried to identify like several goals that could be pursued even in the current situation, even in the situation when we still have the, the war going on. Because obviously if the war ended, especially if it ended with the defeat of the Russian Federation, then many solutions would be, would be finally available. But at the moment, at least five measures that can be taken uh, by states, by uh, international organizations, depending on their specific statutes, their specific mandate. So the first one is, I already mentioned that, and that was also mentioned by other speakers, to really keep the, the topic in the public space, to make sure that it's not forgotten. And that's something that I was seeing in the past month, because it seemed that with the arrest warrant, suddenly everyone was interested in, in the phenomenon, but then after a couple of weeks, it was forgotten, other topics came in, and children somehow disappeared from the public debate. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm so happy that the, 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 the panel is uh, on the agenda. It's very important to keep it in the public space. It's also very important to continue establishing facts. We have the report of the OEC, we have the report of the, of the UN uh, mission of inquiry, but it's important to follow what is happening. So that's the first issue, and that can be done, even in the current situation. The second one, again, something that is ongoing, is really to go on with the criminal investigation at the international level before the ICC, and also at the national level, because in the end, the main investigation always happens at the national level, not in Ukraine, well, ideally in the Russian Federation, but also in the third states. That again, that is again something that can happen, that is happening, and that can go on regardless of the state of the, of the warfare. So that's the second issue. The third one is to try to push the Russian Federation to implement at least some of its international obligations. In the ideal state, obviously, the repatriation of children, if it is unwilling to do so, at least some, let's say, mild obligation. For instance, the obligation to set up the National Information Bureau, which would actually have a list of children which, who have been, uh, let's say, transferred or who have happened to happen in the territory of the Russian Federation, whatever terminology is used by the Russian Federation. That's probably not so strict for the Russian Federation. Uh, Ms. Sorry, Ms. Okay. No, 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 Ms. Belkova, uh, please follow up, but uh, I would like that you uh, like explain what list exclusively for uh, for the case of uh, maybe we have some uh, uh, persons who will inform representatives of the Russian Federation because Maria Lvova Belova uh, said many times repeatedly that she doesn't understand what list <laughs> Federation does not deny that there are Ukrainian children on the territory of the Russian Federation. So the question has a very simple answer. Yeah, whatever they claim, but they don't deny that there are Rus they are Ukrainian children on the territory of the Russian Federation. So it's simple. I mean, the list of those children, whatever status the Russian Federation assigns to them. So that's the third measure, and just to be short, the fourth one is uh, to try to support the the voluntary networks 
uh, which already are in place and which work to really return these children and NGOs play a really a crucial role in this. There might be some unofficial support by the state, but to a large extent, it's really left to families, it's left to NGOs to go to the, uh, to, to the Russian Federation to try to bring these children back. And these networks finance it themselves. Often families finance it themselves. NGOs finance it themselves. I mean, international organizations tend to be much richer than NGOs or than families, the same for states. So again, a very simple thing that can be done is at least to help those who already do something. And the last one that already has been mentioned as well is really to put in place a good program for the rehabilitation, for the uh, social, economic, uh, psychological, and other help that is needed for children themselves, for their families, because this is a very traumatizing event uh, for everyone who is involved. And I would like to finish by one sentence that I really liked in, in the presentation of Maria. Uh, she said, time is playing against us. I think this is a very important consideration because the problem is that both international justice and international organizations work, but they work very slowly. So the time span is very different from the time span of children. And we should not forget that really one year, two years is nothing in the life of the United Nations, but it can be really a milestone in the life of children. And Mr. Samara. Yeah. Um... One thing I have I have seen that has worked in other contexts, uh, for example in Syria, uh, it's not the same situation, but there is a, a, a similar um, there's a situation of children that uh, are stranded in the northeast Syria for, for years. Is um, is what uh, what we have mentioned in terms of keeping advocacy efforts very high towards keeping this point in the agenda very 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 high, uh, and this means international agenda, before United Nations, before uh, countries that are um, close to Russia and countries that are not that close to Russia. Uh, the UN system has a lot of tools. Uh, some of them, they work. Some of them, they take more time to work. For example, um, the Special Rapporteurs is another tool that is existing there. They are quite independent in terms of fixing their agendas. And they can do visits to countries. Uh, so this could be a complementary uh, aspect to what, um, what I, my colleague was mentioning in terms of uh, uh, asking one of these special reporters to go visit Russia and ask for the identification of these children at least. You know? So these are small steps that lead to the, to the bigger steps, always keeping in mind that uh, we are talking about children and child development is, uh, is very important in, in, in this process. And uh, I adhere to the, to the idea that um, domestic investigations and prosecutions are important also in this process because they will clarify step by step the situation of the children. We will uh, we'll start to know exactly what are the ages of the children, what are the profiles of the children, uh, and we need to also support those, those investigations, those domestic investigations, because justice will be here in Ukraine. Uh, and you have that opportunity there. So a multiplicity of tools, I think, is at this stage a, a good approach that we can all support from our um, yeah, professionals. Sure. Like, really short, uh, because uh, I think it's important, because all these uh, steps which uh, now was mentioned, they are really crucial, they are important, but my main point that we need to act much faster, because first deportation, happened in 2014. It was the protection of children from Crimea. And we only have this issue on the agenda in 2022. So we really have to act much faster because we have to be honest, we may not ever found children who was deported in 2014. And a lot of them are not children anymore. And maybe some of them are now fighting in Ukraine against their own country. Yes, uh... Uh, you know, children uh, who were illegally deported from Crimea, uh, like mostly through this program Train of Hope, uh, they were then illegally adopted, and uh, Russians called themselves that it was really adoption, not uh, foster care, guardianship, uh, and so on, and so on, like uh, now pronounced by Maria Lvova Bilova, but it was 
adoption. What does it mean that this, uh, that the name and surname of these children uh, were changed, their date of birth, place of birth, and so on? Uh, that it, uh, and uh, the time. Uh, it's, uh, it was eight years ago, so we can't identify these children, even uh, thanks for some uh, software and uh, other means, because uh, their face were changed. They, maybe they are now not the children, but teenagers and so on. So we need to, to, to understand that uh, every year, like aggravates the situation of these children and uh, our efforts when we are talking about identification and possible um, instruments for this identification. And not only children from Crimea, but unfortunately also children from Donbass who were illegally deported to Russia for adoption. Previously, we uh, didn't have some uh, arguments and like evidence in order to prove this, but now thanks for some efforts of other partners from other organizations, we obtain documents testifying that these children were really illegally deported for adoption and amongst them there were children aged of uh, uh, several months and uh, under one year. So you understand that these children were transferred to illegal adoption. Uh, and uh, I would like also to react uh, to Veronica uh, about uh, cases of repatriation of Ukrainian children. Uh, so one last case, uh, this is a case of a grandma who has managed to repatriate her grandson uh, from uh, the Russian occupied territories of Ukraine. Uh, and Maria Argoa Belova uh, describes this case like her assisting in the repatriation process. However, this grandma was forced to pass a DNA test and then she was forced and she was threatened that if she uh, uh, has not obtained uh, Russian documents uh, and also reissued uh, documents for foster care under this boy, uh, then it uh, would be impossible to return this child to Ukraine. Uh, however, this grandma refused to, to obtain Russian passport because without Russian passport it is impossible to reissue documents uh, for uh, foster care on uh, this child because this child was already recognized a Russian citizen. Uh, and uh, she repatriated this boy through joint efforts of other non-governmental organizations and uh, Ukrainian state bodies, but unfortunately I can uh, go into details. Uh, however, this is one of examples how the Russian Federation now is trying to demonstrate some efforts in the context of repatriation in order maybe to avoid accountability for Putin and Maria Lvova Bilova because actually this process has started since March 2023 after two arrest warrants and Maria Lvova Bilova also uh, declared about uh, her cooperation with the ICRC after this date. Uh, so uh, what we need we need, in order to avoid traumatization of these people, legal representatives, and also re-traumatization of Ukrainian children during this process of repatriation, to establish one unique legal mechanism of repatriation. And this is recommendation of all mechanisms, Moscow mechanism, and also of uh, the International uh, Independent Commission of Inquiry uh, inside the United Nations. So how we can organize this uh, one unique legal repatriation mechanism? Maybe you have some vision, because uh, after your opinions, I would like to share with you and also with our audience uh, the draft of this mechanism elaborated by our organization, Vision Center for Human Rights. Yeah. Uh, It's, it's not an, uh, it's a, a difficult question, yeah? I just read your opinion, <laughs> I don't want to repeat it. Okay, when you can. Maybe Mr. Samara. Yeah, um, you make me think about um, the recently created mechanism for the missing persons in Syria. Uh, this is also the same idea of centralizing the, the, the efforts to, to look for the, for the missing persons in, uh, in, in, in Syria. This was a concerted, concerted effort of the international uh, um, community, but this was driven by the victims. So I think one essential component, and again, uh, I mentioned it before, of uh, this kind of uh, ideas and efforts is that it is, it is it's 
it has the victims. Uh, and in this case, we are talking about the parents or the relatives or those that are looking for their children that have been uh, deported to be also consulted as part of this kind of um, uh, mechanisms. No? Uh, it is very important to have uh, that perspective into, into the process of uh, creating uh, unified, let's say, uh, entry points no? or, or, or this type of ideas to, to centralize. Uh, I think that could be an aspect that could be relevant in that sense, uh, consulting with, um, with the families uh, who are representing the, the victims in, in this case on, 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 yeah, on the different aspects of, of this process. But, uh, I think this could be an element important to, to, to integrate in these, uh, in these ideas. Yes, uh, it is a, a very important element of also of uh, the mechanism proposed by our organization because we see it uh, first of all through the adoption of uh, the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly in uh, which uh, there will be clear requirements for Ukraine, Russia, but also for the states, uh, parties of the Geneva Conventions, according to the Article 1 uh, common to for Geneva Conventions, because not only th this repatriation is not only matter for Ukraine, but also for the whole international community. Also, we would like to do the same like uh, grant initiative, so to conclude the international legal binding agreements between Ukraine and Russia, but through the third party. It may be the third state, the group of states, international organizations, governmental or non-governmental, or for example, some representative of this organization, like uh, uh, special uh, rapporteurs uh, or special representatives of uh, the Secretary General. Uh, and uh, then uh, we would like to uh, guarantees that uh, any mechanism uh, will be built uh, on the principle of uh, um, child best interest. So we need to carry out uh, for each child uh, assessment independent and impartial of uh, the best interest and also to elaborate individual trajectory of repatriation for each child. Because uh, we need to understand where these children will be located, how these children will be rehabilitated and how these children will be reintegrated. So this is uh, our idea, and now I would like to uh, uh, I would like to encourage you to pose your questions because uh, we have another 20 minutes for a meaningful discussion. Please raise your hands, and uh, our team will assist you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your work and for um, uh, the interest in reflections and call for action. Can you hear me? <coughs> My name is Deborah Ruiz Verdusco. I'm the Executive Director of the Trust Group for Victims at the International Criminal Court. We have the mandate to act for the benefit of the victims in the situations under the jurisdiction of the ICC. And that includes, of course, the deportation of children which are under investigation on part of the arrest warrants issued by the International Criminal Court. So I have a very concrete question for you, which is um, you have focused uh, greatly and, and very importantly on the impact of these crimes on children, and they are, they are war crimes and crimes against humanity. It's important to mention that component. Um, and that is very important to know and devise what are going to be the measures looking like uh, for rehabilitation and uh, reintegration. Um, I want to mention here the experiences of the ICC greatly on the issue of child soldiers, uh, the use of children in the context of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Uganda, where there are actually right now preparation proceedings ongoing. Um, that benefit uh, thousands of, of, of former child soldiers, now adults, and uh, we can share experiences about that. Um, and that would be my question. So there is that element, okay, how, how it would look like. But more urgently, there is also an impact on the families who are looking for these children. So if you can speak also about that impact, uh, because some measures and some initiatives will also look at that, uh, that element, not only at the individual level, and this is, I'm borrowing here from my own experience working with missing persons, 
uh, but there is an individual impact, there is a family impact of a parent having to look for a child, which means they neglect all the other parental duties, they are unable to work, they are unable to sleep. Uh, there is a community uh, being broken and, and, and very large impact. So if you can maybe develop that. Now, um, that's my question, my second question. Now, the third one is simply uh, to uh, encourage you, just like the reference to the Syria mechanism on missing persons, I believe it's a very interesting one, but to look at many, every single conflict uh, in the history has had this component of children because they are trying to tackle the weakest point and the most important element for the future. So in the military dictatorships in South America, um, the disappeared persons, the children were taken away, and as you know, the mothers of Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, hello, yeah, are, um, are, are right now, and they have learned of what, you know, in the past and very painfully, how they are recovering the children that were taken away when they were babies with elements of identification. So that is a, a, an interesting dialogue that I believe the families could be having with those mothers who in, in, in South America have had those initiatives of recovering children. The second example as well, and it's very important to illustrate it in context, the separation of children in the border of US-Mexico. Uh, you know, what has been the, the measures to be taken to, to ensure proper documentation? Uh, so all these are, are not the same situations, but they are, they are speaking of uh, experiences of, of countries to deal with uh, the, the way uh, war and, and the targeting of children has been done. Uh, Latin America had El Salvador and Colombia children recruited into our forces as well, and they have dealt with in a different manner. So I think there is so much to learn from successes and failures in the past to make sure that the response for the children deported in the case of Ukraine um, takes the best and is as successful as possible in the midst of this tragedy. Thank you. So we would like to collect the questions. Małgorzata Skawińska, uh, international lawyer, not specialist in your field, uh, but also member of uh, charity organization, local charity organization. My question is basic. In terms of uh, children deportation, what is the typical modus operandi? Uh, maybe I'm not aware of that, but uh, I think it's important, and the question is also, are there, uh, yeah, assuming that uh, this model apparently is uh, uh, constantly changing, are there any uh, actions, or are there any uh, um, news, uh, are there any, are parents are being uh, prepared uh, about precautions to, to do it? We, uh, in last year, uh, we organized a summer camp for uh, 50, uh, 50 children from Chernihiv. And uh, I know there were some precautions, but uh, yeah, I'm, mm, I, I'm very interested in how, uh, how, how is the modus operandi of, uh, of Federation, the Russian Federation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo Buscar, Council of Europe. Uh, the question I have, uh, and I, I rather like the idea of different legal mechanisms to be used. The question I have is, to what extent can you use the existing hard conventions uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, deportation of children? Uh, because Russia seems to be a party of these conventions. Um, you know, international child abduction. Conventions. And another question I have that relates to the best interests of the child, which is a part of the discussions also in the Reykjavik summit of the Council of Europe documents, and as well as uh, the uh, recent Riga declaration of the ministers of justice of the Council of Europe, refers to the best interests of the child in, in these kind of return proceedings. To what extent, from your point of view, the best interests of the child can actually block? the return, uh, is it a possibility? And, and finally, uh, concerning the Moscow mechanism, just a general observation probably, to what extent is this mechanism uh, useful and how efficient it is in this context as well? Thank you. And uh, I guess the last question for this round. 
Hi, my name is Natalia. I'm founder of Ukraine Mona Foundation. We help orphans in Ukraine and we do trainings for war trauma. But actually this topic is very new for me. And I'm my question probably is going to be from very normal person from Ukraine, from Ukrainian who actually doesn't know the laws, doesn't know um, what is going on. Because I, uh, this is actually uh, the first time I'm listening very carefully about all of the process, how we do with the children. Um, and for me, uh, I heard today a lot of about uh, we need to put all of the energy and resources to report children back um, and all about children but I think also we need to focus more on um, Russian Federation because how I understood from today uh, since 2014 nobody from Russian Federation was put in a, in a jail right um, or maybe I don't know this is was my first question if someone uh, in the jail or put in the court for this crime in all of these nine years. If not, I would like to hear more specific action. What exactly we need to do? Because I heard, yeah, we need to be more proactive. We need to collaborate together. We need to be the blah, blah, blah. But what exactly? We need to put the troops. We need to go to Russia and find the people who are responsible for those crimes and bring them back to your European court or what exactly we need to do as a country, Ukraine, the government, and as a, like the world, other organi international organization, specific actions that could us put more closer to, we need them to feel that they, they have to respond they have to be in jail, someone needs to be in jail, and then they start to learn that, oh, maybe I'm not going to do that because there is this, this. There is, like, um, I, can be in, I can be arrested or responsibility. So I just so want to hear more uh, clear answer. What exactly we need to do if is someone is in a jail for those crimes. Okay, the last question, because we need to, to try to stay on track. So the last question. Hi, thank you. My name is Jax Harrison. I have a company called Innovation for Good and a foundation called Stop Child Traffic. We work on preventing harm to women and children and displaced persons. And particularly in this situation, I'd like to know not only now, because this has occurred, how we can further prevent this from occurring again, and how we are working towards prevention, both here and across the EU and across the globe, really, so that this kind of um, incidents doesn't happen again, and that we are really focused on prevention. We must rescue the children, we must find a solution, but my goal is that we never have to rescue a child, and that there is never suffering for any person in this manner, because how can you call that humanity? That is not being kind. There's no kindness in this action. So that's my question. Okay, 80 seconds. Thank you. Already six. Senior Yates, Advocacy Coordinator, to Protection National Ukrainian Organization. I will also uh, would like to ask whether we should think about some kind of like amendment of national legal, criminal legal framework to be able to con to um, indict to indict uh, or to convict uh, induct or convict uh, like uh, Russians in legal framework, legal cr criminal framework. Okay, so uh, we, we can start. No, Mrs. So Mrs. So many, so many questions. Let, let me answer two of them. Uh, first about recovery or rehabilitation of kids. They are better experts than myself. But two things are important. First, um, these children need to know that this is not their fault, what has happened. This is absolutely crucial. These are children and they have to know that. And the second thing, this is the lesson we learned 
from recovery of victims of uh, human trafficking. The surviving process means that they have power, that they are empowered to understand that they will overcome the trauma. And there are people around them ready to help. So that's very briefly because we don't have time. But I'm glad that there was a question about Council of Europe because I have a, a little bit of problem with that because I don't see any uh, limited role for, for the in existing instruments of Council of Europe, but I do see the role for Council of Europe. For example, I would, I would dream to have a model of information bureau that Veronica mentioned. How to organize this bureau in democratic countries to collect information about kids. That is the role of Council of Europe. Summit, it was important, but uh, we know what is the impact of, of the summit um, in, in Reykjavik. Then, I, I would expect that Council of Europe will ask all European countries who still hold the diplomatic missions in Russia, in Russia to collect information about children. And, and finally, that uh, will Council of Europe this way or another will ask democratic countries in Europe who are secret services in Russia still or agents to collect information because repatriation will be possible provided that we know where are the children. Ms. Verdelka? Yeah, difficult to fit within the time frame. I'll try to be brief. So the first issue, uh, indeed, we can le learn a lot from the experience of other regions. We can also learn a lot from our from the experience of our own region. This is not the first time when children get uh, abducted, I mean, or displaced. We, we saw it during the Second World War. We saw it in the region during the communist period. Not always instances of good practice, but instances of some practice to learn from. That's the first issue. The second one, the, the typical modus operandi, indeed, there are some model situations which tend to repeat themselves again and again, three or four. The first one, the first ground or alleged ground for uh, the displacement of children is the evacuation for security purposes. So the argument is there is a threat to children because the, the, the battlefield is moving on, we need to bring them to, sec uh, to, to safety. Sometimes it might be e even, even lawful to do so, but obviously not to keep them for a long time. So that's the first scenario. The second one, separation from families at the so-called filtration camps or filtration points where uh, the, 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 the parents, normally the father, is kept to one side and the children are disappear somewhere else. That's the second scenario. The third one is indeed uh, the, uh, the, the displacement specifically for the purposes of adoption or foster care, mainly from Crimea, as was already mentioned, this Poyas Nadezhdi, the train of hope. And the fourth one is uh, also already mentioned, the, uh, the, the, the displacement for the so -called rec or to the so-called recreation camp, sometimes originally with the approval of parents, but obviously when the children are not returned to their families, the, the original uh, consensus or agreement by parents uh, is simply no longer, uh, no longer uh, valid. So that's the second question. The third one, the changes in the legal framework, that's a very complex issue. I just mentioned for Ukraine that it would be really good to do at least three steps. One is finally to introduce the concept of crimes against humanity into the criminal code. The second one is generally to uh, change, to revise, to amend the criminal code to make it fully in line with the Rome Statute. And the last one is finally to ratify the Rome Statute. And just to mention, this is something that has been really pushed by uh, other actors, not since 2022, but already many years before. So that's something that should be done as quickly as possible and as the legal framework allows for it. That's the third issue. The, 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 the fourth one, the best interest of the child, can it, uh, can it sometimes uh, play against uh, the, uh, the, the, the return, the repatriation? We have a very long section on the best uh, interest of the child in the report, so I, I obviously can't cover all this. Uh, but on this specifically, uh, I don't, uh, well, I can imagine a situation like that, but it would be very exceptional and it would really need to be for a child coming from a very specific, uh, problematic milieu brought to some, uh, for instance, a relative in the Russian Federation and then be kept there in the relative family. But that would be very exceptional. But otherwise, the best uh, interest of the child would clearly play in favor of family reunification and return to the original place of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, residence. 
And finally, the Moscow mechanism, does it make any sense? Is it efficient? Depends on how we measure efficiency. Has it changed the situation completely? No. Has it been a part of or a piece of the puzzle that gets together? Yes, otherwise Russian Federation would not care. The fact that it always came to the meeting, that it always cared, that it always raised uh, objections, uh, suggests that it, it has some, some, uh, some sense. Let's keep it to this. Thank you, thank you. Um, I will be also really short as the time. Uh, regarding the first question, uh, it's important to have, uh, first of all, safe place where children are coming back because a lot of children uh, was deported and transferred uh, from the places which are unsafe and they need to come back to the safe places. And um, along with what was already mentioned, it's also important to prepare host communities because we need to work with teachers uh, and prepare teachers to work with these children because these children will come back to their normal schools. And uh, from the experience of other countries, it is really important to have uh, proper psychologists in the schools who know how to work with uh, children who are traumatized by war and who know how to work with uh, uh, classes which have different experience, completely different experience of war. So uh, we need to ensure that these children will, will be able to feel safety uh, in the places where they returned. And another question which is, um, I also want to uh, answer is uh, about um, uh, justice. Uh, unfortunately, no, we don't have uh, justice for this crime yet. And the arrest warrant of ICC is one of the important steps to this justice. And on the local level, unfortunately, we still have not a lot of cases on the even Ukrainians who are part of this system, and this should be changed, and uh, uh, this is now changing, so we have to advocate and to uh, put pressure, like to help uh, even our prosecutor office uh, to investigate these cases and to have uh, uh, basically decisions on these cases, so other people will feel that there will be uh, uh, justice for such cases. And one, like, I think which I don't really like, but which is could work is a sanction mechanism, personal sanctions on the people who are responsible for these crimes. It is one of the steps which is could at least work now. Thank you. And maybe Mr. Salmaron, uh, as of uh, amendments to our uh, criminal legislation, uh, or uh, to some other questions. Yeah, I was going to maybe uh, say something on the on the um, on the impact um, and how this has to be uh, integrated from the beginning of the investigations. Uh, and uh, and I I would say I would say that it has to be um, child centric. Uh, normally, when we ask uh, about impact, we always ask a parent about the impact on the child. No, I think uh, our our way of looking at things is very adult centric. So uh, I'm always uh, suggesting to really um, try to to do uh, an investigation that includes from the beginning all these impact analysis and collection of evidence that relates to the impact. Another element, not just how uh, the child is, is suffering the impact, but it's very important, the peers. You know, how children that were with those children are also having an impact on that. You know? uh, mainly adolescents. When, when we speak about adolescents, social life is extremely important. When they lose a, child, a friend, when they lose a, a sibling, that's, that's, that may have a huge impact in their lives, even more than other things that adults we think that are impacting them in that sense. And I'm, I'm also saying something on, 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 on reparations. Uh, again, I think it's something that we need to think from the beginning. And, and again, I think it's, it's very good to consult children, not just the direct child victims of a crime, but all the children need to be part of consultations. I was in, uh, listening to the panel previously, uh, and I think it's very important that in all those processes, in those pilot projects, talking about remedies or, uh, or any kind of future forward looking of how this looks when, when everything is um, adjudicated in terms of justice, that we start thinking about that right now from the perspective of the children. What is important for them? What is in, in a, the, what is in the best interest of them? I think the best interest of, so just say something. No, it's okay. Let's stay. The Thank best you. interest of the child for me is always part of the solution. It's never a problem. Uh, and uh, actually, the right to be heard is also one of the rights of the child um, enshrined uh, into the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child. And I would like to answer maybe the last question related to the Hague Conventions. Uh, 
because uh, Ukraine was trying to use this mechanism and to implement uh, uh, some um, provisions of uh, uh, conventions. And uh, now, already in 2022, we had the declaration made by the Hague Conference where it was indicated that uh, uh, it is prohibited to change the uh, legal status of all children displaced by Russians and uh, that the Russian Federation need to stop this practice. So we had this declaration and also Ukraine demanded, uh, requested all state parties to inform uh, our state uh, as of some cases uh, of illegal deportation and forcible transfer. So it seems that uh, Ukraine is uh, really trying to, to, to do all the best, but uh, unfortunately the Russian Federation is still to create additional obstacles uh, as uh, of repatriation of Ukrainian children. Uh, just to recap, uh, today we have uh, mm, we, we had discussed a really important issue related to unlawful deportation and forcible transfer of Ukrainian children. We uh, understood uh, why the Russian Federation uh, did it and uh, what uh, are the means to eradicate Ukrainian national identity of uh, our children, of affected children. We were trying to predict the future mechanism of repatriation of our children and even cover the issues related to rehabilitation and reintegration. Uh, I think that uh, our discussion was enlightening and uh, very thought-provoking, and I hope that uh, we will have uh, such conversation in the future. Thank you to our distinguished panelists. It was uh, really, really.